So hello and welcome to Webinar Wednesdays from the Deep Carbon Observatory. My name is Katie Pratt and I'm part of DCO's engagement team based at the University of Rhode Island. This webinar is brought to you by Engagement and DCO Synthesis Group 2019. Today's webinar is the third in a series focused on synthesizing science in which we're highlighting some of DCO synthesis projects. The goal of DCO synthesis effort is to bring together 10 years of deep carbon science and share what our scientific community has learned and what remains unknown and perhaps unknowable about the quantities, movements, forms and origins of carbon in Earth. It is my pleasure to introduce you to today's presenters. Dr. Sabin Zirovich is a postdoctoral research associate in the Earthbike Group at the University of Sydney. In his collaboration with DCO, Sabin has participated in several early career scientist events and in April of last year, co-hosted a two-day Earthbike modeling workshop at the University of Cambridge to bring together a range of interdisciplinary early career and senior researchers to tackle the deep time planetary carbon cycle. Kevin Wong is a PhD student based in the UK whose research interests include understanding volcanic carbon fluxes through geological time. In collaboration with Sabin, Kevin is using models of tectonic parameters generated through G-plate software combined with present day observations made at volcanic settings and subduction zones to quantify mantle fluxes of carbon. And Madison East, is a research assistant at the University of Sydney, working as part of the Earthbike Group to investigate subduction volume flux through time. The Earthbike Group, led by Dietmar Muller, um, based at the University of Sydney, has created a virtual plate tectonic deep carbon laboratory, revolutionizing scientists' ability to understand mantle crust atmosphere interactions in deep time. The group is designing tools that can be applied and used by their peers in DCO-inspired research. In this webinar, Sabin, Kevin and Madison will share their modelling expertise and showcase some of their modelling work using the G-Plates platform. But before I hand over the mic to Sabin, a few bits of housekeeping. The presentation portion of the webinar will last about 10 minutes and then we'll go into an interview portion. If you have any questions you'd like to ask our panel, please type them into the chat and we'll address them in the interview section. The chat is also where we'll post any relevant links. So with that, I'm pleased to sign off and turn it over to Sabin. Okay, wow, well, thank you so much, Katie. And thank you, uh, Josh, for organizing this. I'm just about to share my screen and get myself going. Um, as Katie mentioned, I'm based at the University of Sydney um, in the Earthbite Group. And I've been extremely lucky to be part of the DCO efforts since 2015. Um, I've also been extremely lucky to work with such a vibrant team and, and I'm really proud that uh, and I'm really glad that Maddie uh, and Kev uh, could join us uh, today. I think uh, uh, one of the things that DCO has done really well is foster future scientists and the future uh, generation of researchers and uh, Madison and Kevin are um, clear examples of, of that success. Um, First of all, I'd also like to thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for their support, uh, and of course, all of the team at the Deep Carbon Observatory for helping us in the past few years. So uh, hopefully you can see here a, a picture of uh, a, a, actually a small portion of the team. This was at the University of Cambridge last year, uh, and below is a very long list of very close collaborators. Uh, the, the wonderful thing about the DCO is that we've built a really wonderful network uh, of interdisciplinary uh, researchers. So I really uh, uh, thank all, uh, all involved uh, in, in their efforts. Uh, and these are just some of the partners and, and um, institutions we've been working with. But really, one of the th reasons and motivations why we became so interested in planetary deep carbon uh, cycling is this idea that tectonics modulates long-term climate on planet Earth. It is one unique aspect of the habitability and the life support mechanisms of our planet. And so in the geological record, we, we know that there's been episodes of uh, snowball Earth, uh, but also episodes of greenhouse climates. And uh, uh, many of these instances have been either driven or contributed to by tectonics and mantle connection. But a really interesting component 
is also the interaction with the biosphere. Um, that's something that the, the DCO has done really well, which, which is to, to link um, you know, biological processes to, to, to earth um, physical processes. So our group has been primarily interested in trying to understand the exchange of carbon between reservoirs and deep earth, the mantle and the lithosphere crust and, and the surface, right? And, and we've been able to use this community software that we've developed called G-Plates uh, to look at uh, continental rifts, uh, mid-ocean ridges, subduction zones, uh, the interaction between subduction zones and buried carbonate platforms, for example, um, ophiolites and, and collisions, uh, mountain building events and what that means for atmospheric carbon. As you can see, there's actually regions um, here in, in this uh, cutaway um, of mantle plumes, these, these upwellings um, in, in the mantle. And what they produce are these large igneous provinces, which have been implicated in major perturbations to the global carbon cycle. Now, um, all of this has been enabled by community software um, that we've been developing uh, in a group effort across multiple institutions, but the idea has been to uh, model Earth systems at different spatial and temporal scales. Everything from uh, whole mantle convection to plate tectonics and deformation on the surface uh, to the evolution of surfaces, erosion and deposition in basins. And Madison will even talk about how uh, this tool called Badlands has been uh, extended to, to capture um, uh, reef growth, carbonate platforms, and so on. Um, and of course, in the future, we're hoping to have more integrated models of atmospheric ocean circulation. But um, at the bottom here, G-plates is, is probably what I'll focus most on, and that's uh, been led um, by Dietmar Muller and Mike Gurness at Caltech. Um, and John Cannon is our lead developer, and Tristan Saal is the lead developer of Badlands. So G-Plates uh, is a really uh, interesting tool. It's, it's unique in the sense that it's completely open source, it's cross-platform, um, Mac, Linux, Windows, you can install it on any of those platforms very easily. It's very interactive. We have lots of documentation. I'm happy to, to go through a little live demonstration. Uh, but the novelty in G-Plates came about when we actually started building the reconstructions and realizing that we needed to have a formal way of capturing the evolution of plate boundaries and these plate topologies. And you can see here on the, on the right in this animation, um, the, the, the white lines represent the plate boundaries and their um, interlocking mosaic of, uh, of networks creates these plate topologies we can sample the plate velocities. We can link these models to uh, numerical mantle flow simulations. And many, have, uh, many of these models have also been linked to um, uh, uh, um, ocean circulation, climate modeling, um, and, and other applications. So we became involved in deep carbon observatory activities in 2015, the modeling and visualization workshop in Washington, DC. You'll be able to see me here at the back. Uh, and uh, essentially there we discussed what kind of software uh, and platforms would enable uh, the community approach to deep carbon science. And so G-Plates, because it was open source, uh, cross-platform, and there were already models um, involved, uh, that became one obvious way forward. And um, many of you would be aware of this uh, wonderful work from the Deep Carbon Observatory led by Emily Mason, Marie Edmonds, and Alexandra Turchin uh, on how um, uh, buried limestones, carbonates are uh, remobilized. Uh, the, the carbon, the, the uh, carbon dioxide is remobilized through volcanic um, emissions at subduction zones. And so we uh, looked at this in a deep time context with uh, Jody Powell and uh, Sam Doss. Uh, we took these mapped um, uh, carbonate platforms in the geological, uh, in geological time. Um, and we wanted to see uh, through geological time um, to what extent this outgassing may actually have been driving um, atmospheric CO2 uh, uh, over the last 400 million years. 
<clears throat> and so um, in G plates, this is what we get. Essentially, this is the output. You see the continents um, uh, here in, in this brown, the, the plate boundaries, uh, and the subduction zones, importantly, in pink, with the subduction polarities um, indicated by the teeth. Um, and then these carbonate platforms um, in, in blue. And whenever they're close to the subduction zone um, in, in an overriding plate setting, uh, that registers as an interaction. Um, and so we can play that forward through time. And this is the assembly of Pangaea uh, and the breakup of Pangaea. And eventually, you'll see also the breakup of Gondwana and India crashing into uh, Eurasia. Okay. So these are the kind of models that we can build in G-plates. These are interactive models that can be interrogated. Uh, um, and and um, this is an example of an output from that interrogation. Here is time on the x-axis from 400 million years to the present. Um, I'm not going to dwell too much on this, but essentially uh, what you see in blue is um, atmospheric CO2. And then the, the black line here is the carbonate intersecting um, uh, continental arcs, uh, and it's very difficult to actually uh, visually see, see these relationships. So what we did, applied some numerical approaches, um, the, the, uh, this kind of um, uh, cross wavelet transforms and, and so on, comparing two time series, one being the atmospheric CO2 and the other these uh, interactions between subduction zones and carbonate platforms. And they give us an idea of when the interactions um, at the subduction zones may be important to atmospheric CO2. And really the take home message was that really in the uh, assembly of Pangaea between 350 and 300 million years ago, and between 75 and 50 million years ago during that Tethian subduction, the collision of India and Eurasia, that these uh, carbonate intersecting um, continental arcs are correlated and in phase um, with CO2 and actually slightly lead the CO2 signal. And that's the real power of, of these kind of numerical approaches is that, you know, I'm not just looking at uh, uh, peaks and troughs uh, in a time series. Um, one of the things that we became interested in um, as well was the idea of subduction zone lengths and how they represent slab flux. Uh, and so here is a really neat study from uh, Vandermeer et al. in 2012, um, using seismic tomography, interpreting, inferring where subduction zones um, have been. Um, we've done the same thing using the plate reconstructions and we get um, the subduction zone lengths, but to what extent do they um, actually uh, translate to, to slab flux? And Madison uh, East has actually uh, led this process. So I might actually um, stop my sharing and hand it over to Maddie. Sure, I'll, um, hopefully you can hear me now. I'm just gonna share that PowerPoint on my screen for everyone. Um, alrighty, I think we should hopefully now be back to where we were. Yeah, so as Sabin was saying, I um, started a project that was looking at subduction through time, specifically subducting area flux, or subducting plate area flux, and then slab volume flux. So the amount of area or the amount of volume of slab material going into the mantle through time. And I was looking um, back to 230 million years ago. And this project was really interesting because it kind of, um, it highlights sort of the power of G plates, not just to be a visualization tool, but something that you can actually, you know, extract data from. Um, yes, yeah, so you've seen that animation play once. This is basically the slab volume flux um, through time and where dark blue, that's a, um, a lot of slab volume being subducted. Um, so what I did was I could sample along each of the subduction zones um, at equal intervals and it was about five arc degrees, I think was the length we sampled at. Um, and at each of those points for every time step, you can extract things like the convergence rate, the convergence obliquity, um, and also say what the age of the seafloor is that's being subducted in that particular region. And so from there, then I can easily calculate things like subducting um, plate area and sub flux. Um, if we go to this next um, slide, you can kind of see these two curves. You have the area in the sort of red and the um, slab flux volume in the blue. Um, 
so subducting seafloor area is interesting in terms of the deep carbon cycle because as Sabin was saying before, not just if say carbonate platforms are subducted, but also carbonate sediments like deep sea sediments from pelagic organisms, um, these sorts of things when they're subducted um, at con and create continental arcs and volcanism, then you can have that sort of the release of carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. Um, so you kind of, it's more sort of an, an immediate, um, well not super immediate, but kind of short term response. Um, slab flux then is um, quite interesting in that some of the work I've done has shown that perhaps uh, the volume of material doesn't um, have an immediate impact, but um, on a longer term scale, it can influence sort of the convection in the mantle, and it actually may trigger more upwelling of hot mantle material, which could lead to more large igneous provinces and um, uh, releasing of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere that way. Uh, the slab flux, um, of course, to have a volume, we needed to figure out the thickness of the seafloor that was being subducted. And so basically what we could use is a plate cooling model, which relates the age of the seafloor to um, its thickness, because it's a pretty um, well-known relationship. And there's quite a few different cooling models. Of course, um, you could, we tested a few different ones. Um, yeah, and at the end of the day, we just wanted to see the temporal changes. So this is just presenting um, the volume using one of those um, cooling models. Um, yeah, and one other thing, um, which, here you go, that we were able to look at um, with this project is kind of um, to debunk the old, a uh, long-standing kind of idea that subduction zone length alone could be used as a proxy for say the subducting plate area or slab flux. Um, as you can see um, in the graph on the left, there's not a one-to-one -one relationship. There's a big difference between you know, subducting, subducting zone length and the plate area because of changes in convergence rates on um, a regional and temporal scale. Um, you can see on the, on the right graph, however, there's less of a difference between subducting plate area and slab flux. And it's more just say in particular regions where there was particularly thick um, oceanic crust that was being subducted, like old thick crust um, may have created differences in the two trends. Um, and I think, yeah, I may talk more about um, this sort of project later, but I think I'll hand back to Sabin now. Um, yeah. I'll stop sharing. Great. Well, wonderful uh, uh, work, uh, uh, Maddie. I mean, it's been a great inspiration to, to work with you, Kev, and uh, all, all the rest of the team. Um, so I'll jump back in um, and just show you uh, what Maddie was actually talking about that um, from these G plates models, we can link them to the numerical models of mantle convection. And in blue, you see these subducting uh, plates, uh, the lithosphere, it, um, it, um, it triggers mantle return flow and you actually see these plumes, mantle plumes erupting. Uh, and these are the large igneous provinces uh, that erupt and bring a lot of CO2 into the atmosphere from the mantle. And I'll just quickly show also another uh, project that we did uh, with Lewis Johansson, another talented student. And you can see the uh, eruption of these large igneous provinces through time in black, but also this blue band, which is the near equatorial humid belt, which is where there's lots of weathering um, of, of these uh, basaltic rocks. Uh, leading to sequestration of atmospheric CO2. So we could extract through time the uh, erupting uh, area. Of course, one of the problems is that we only have the present day area, um, not the original erupted area. Uh, that's actually a focus of future work. But in any case, here's our atmospheric CO2 again in gray. Uh, in uh, orange here uh, is, is uh, the eruption of these large igneous provinces. Uh, and then here in the different lines, um, the colored lines represents the, the weathering in a near equatorial latitude. So you can see how we can actually interrogate these models and extract more uh, meaning from them. Um, and um, maybe in the discussion later, we can, we can actually get some more insight from uh, Maddie, but, but Tristan Sal and, um, uh, and, and others um, had been developing this um, surface process code that models uh, erosion, and the position of sediments on continental scales, uh, but also has a new carbonate uh, module. So coral reefs are really interesting because uh, as they live 
as they grow, they actually produce CO2, they're a net emitter of CO2, but because they build these carbonate platforms, um, as, as they grow, um, they actually are sequestering CO2 on long-term uh, geological time scales. Um, so that's an interesting uh, development. And um, um, of course, we're trying to synthesize the components of, of uh, the tectonic uh, system um, of, the, of the deep carbon cycle. And here's probably a good time to just hand over to Kev, um, uh, Kevin, who's actually been helping us um, uh, quantify these components. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and uh, Kevin can jump in. All right. Uh, well, let's see if I can share the PowerPoint from this end. Uh, so this should pop up exactly there. Brilliant. So yeah, uh, what I've been trying to do is I've been taking everything we've looked at so far in terms of the G-plates modeling and in relating that to a more geological aspect of uh, carbon cycling. So in the past 10 years, the decade program has made some major advances in quantifying the carbon fluxes coming out of particular tectonic settings. And as you saw in that Kellerman and Manning figure, uh, Sabin just threw up just then, uh, the fluxes are quite well constrained to the present day. So we can take those fluxes and say, all right, for a given length or for a given uh, area, what kind of carbon flux would we expect from this particular tectonic setting? So the first figure I'm sharing over here is, uh, well, it's three squiggly lines. The red squiggly line is the carbon expected from uh, volcanic settings, the total outgassing of volcanic carbon, with that peak at 125 being the eruption of the Ontong Java uh, plateaus. The blue line is total ingassing, so that's subduction of uh, carbonate in sediments, carbonate in oceanic crust, carbonate in uh, serpentinite. And this uh, dip over here that you see at around 140 is meant to represent the uh, Mesozoic Revolution, which saw a major radiation in phytoplankton evolution. And then the green line and the green area represents what happens when we subtract the blue line from the red line. And as you can see, the green line spends most of its time uh, bouncing around 100 megatons of carbon per year, only dipping beneath uh, zero at about 125 million years or so. So this seems to suggest that total net outgassing has been positive over the past 200 million years, generally. And it's, I think it's also worth pointing out that for this part of the uh, talk, we're considering only the carbon that crosses the moho, really. There's no um, consideration of cycling both on the surface and within the deep earth. And if we look at the second figure, I've also uh, plotted on the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations from Foster et al. And you can see there are some bits which correlate quite well. For example, at about 125 million years, that seems to dip down just as the carbon dioxide atmospheric content dips down as well. However, there are also major parts which don't really correlate, for example, from 50 million years onwards to the present day. And that might suggest that there's a surface sink of carbon dioxide that we aren't accounting for when considering how this links into atmospheric carbon dioxide. Or maybe there's storage elsewhere that we can't see, for example, in the sub lithospheric uh, the subcontinental lithospheric mantle. Uh, so the first figure I'm showing here basically follows through from what I was saying before about how much of the carbon being in-gassed is then outgassed, or rather that the ratio of in-gassing carbon to outgassing carbon lies generally below one, which suggests that there is significantly more outgassing. And the second figure over there shows that rifts, continental rifts, seemingly dominate the contributions from volcanic settings. However, this might just be what it appears to look like, just because of the uncertainties at the moment in quantifying continental rift fluxes. Uh, Sasha Brun recently put out a paper attempting to put a number to the aerial carbon flux from continental rifts and the uncertainties are quite substantial. There is a significant difference in uh, the carbon generated from rift settings. And so one of the major things that we're trying to work on at the moment is to be able to properly quantify what carbon from continental rifts is like. And that's one of the focuses of my PhD. I'll be looking at how we can produce a minimum estimate 
for the carbon coming out of the main Ethiopian rift in Ethiopia from uh, active volcanic eruptions. So uh, I think that's all I need to mention at this point. I'll hand back over to Sabin now. There you well, go. Um, I, I don't have anything else to say. Uh, this, is, uh, this is, I think, where we should open it up for discussion uh, and take some questions. Well, thank you all. That was really fantastic insight into the power of these modeling and visualization tools. Lots of very different uh, things going on. Um, so, Sabin, I want to start by asking you, um, how? so you're trying to model deep carbon movements through deep time. That's one of the things that you're trying to do. How far back in time can you go? Oh, uh, this is a great question. Um, so, a lot of our detailed work has looked and gone back to the Pangaea time, right? Because we have preserved seafloor um, because of the breakup of Pangaea. But once you go uh, for times before Pangaea, you don't have any preserved seafloor spreading history. So you really rely on uh, continental paleomagnetic data and, and so on. And that's where you actually have to create synthetic plates, synthetic oceanic plates. Um, and that's where, you know, certainty in the model diminishes greatly uh, in terms of the subducting, um, subduction zone fluxes, right? But, but the plate reconstructions, I mean, we're, we, we're back to the Devonian and we're pushing it now. We have, a, we have a working model back to a billion years. So essentially, um, all the components are there, but you know, to, to reduce the uncertainties, one would want to uh, test test those reconstructions and geodynamic models to see that you've got reasonable, you know, subducting uh, convergence rates and things like that. Wow, a billion years, that's crazy. Um, so I just want to pause for a second and invite Kevin and Madison to turn their video cameras and m microphones back on so they can be part of this discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And um, Kevin, I wanted to like, uh, to ask you a question next, because um, you mentioned how you are using data from the decade program for some of your modeling work. Um, mm -hmm. Are there other sources of data that you're incorporating? And if so, what are they and how do people get a hold of them? Uh, yeah, so I've just been doing a large uh, synthesis of present day carbon fluxes, which we're then using as a basis to then extrapolate our values through time. So for example, for mid-ocean ridges, I compiled as much as I could of um, mid-ocean ridge carbon fluxes published in the past 10 years or so, and use the value which captured the uncertainty in all that, in all those estimates. Uh, for large igneous provinces and ocean island basalts, I established a base flux based on what ocean islands are producing at the present day. And for the logic against province side of things, I assumed that there would be a certain amount of carbon present based on melt inclusion data uh, in basaltic magmas, and then from there modulated the uh, Johansson curve to match the carbon degassed if the entire basaltic stack were to degas. Uh, for subduction zones, I did incorporate the differentiation that uh, Mason et al. mentioned. So I used um, the PAL model. And from there, I was able to get a curve, which basically starts off at the present day estimates of Kellerman and Manning of about 13 to 43 megatons of carbon per year, and then see what happens if I just let uh, carbonate differentiation run wild for the past 200 million years. So yeah, it's all basically based off of what you can see nowadays at uh, different tectonic settings and also what these G-plates guys have been doing. So, um you've all kind of been touching on the fact that you're bringing together all sorts of different data sets in these models. I was wondering, um, Sabin, maybe Madison, you might want to comment here too. What are the biggest hurdles in terms of producing these plate tectonic reconstructions and digital earth models? Well, maybe Maddie can start and, and I can jump yeah. in. I think it was kind of um, similar to what Sabin was saying before, that when you sort of go further back in time, you have less geological evidence that's preserved, and therefore the constraints, you know, you don't have such a good constraint. Um, particularly for my project, um, the Pacific region, like the kind of Pacific basin, um, it's, uh, it's quite a tricky area to reconstruct, even say, you know, from 100 million years 
um, back. We have like quite a good understanding back to about 83. We have a very good robust um, understanding because there's preserved um, seafloor spreading between Antarctica and Australia and you can then build quite a robust sort of um, plate motion hierarchy. And then so in the Pacific back to about 100 million years you have um, hotspot tracks which can give you an idea of sort of where the plates are moving. But um, prior to that there's sort of um, a lot of like the evidence we need has been destroyed at the subduction zones um, rimming the Pacific. So we have to sort of make some assumptions like assuming um, symmetrical spreading um, and looking at the magnetic lineations that you sort of see on the Pacific plate um, and things like that. So it, it can be hard to know exactly um, how well constrained it is and um, that I guess, yeah, is something that we have to consider in all the analysis that we do. Um, yeah, I would say that's a hurdle. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would just add a, a few things to that. Um, the, the models that we build, I mean, for example, just the seafloor spreading histories, they're made up of more than 100,000 uh, individual data points from, from the magnetic anomaly identifications. Um, and so yes, for the Pacific plate, for example, it preserves one flank of that seafloor spreading history, but there is an Agi plate, the Farallon plate has been lost to subduction. And so essentially, as Maddie was alluding, we can resurrect those subducted plates um, by, by assuming uh, symmetrical uh, seafloor spreading and we just uh, uh, get that plate back. Um, but we can also test our plate reconstructions going forward in time. Uh, well, I mean, if we start back at Pangaea time and couple it to the geodynamic models, mantle convection, mantle flow models, we can predict the state of the mantle. Uh, and, and so then we can compare that to the uh, seismic tomography imaging uh, of the mantle to see how, you know, how crazy our model is or how close it might be to reality. Uh, so there are definitely ways that we can test the validity of the models, but you know, that we've had 10, 20 years of work in this, uh, you know, but there's still a lot to do, uh, a lot of exciting things that will come out in the next uh, decade, I, I suspect. <laughs> Very cool. So, um, Sabina, so I wanted to ask you about um, some of the collaborations that you've had. So it's not, you don't just collaborate with TCO, you collaborate with all sorts of people. And um, I was wondering if you could speak to um, what maybe some of the trickiest integrations have been, you know, working with G plates and, or other platforms and then the other projects that are bringing in their data. Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, for, for, for us, because the D series has been such a vibrant, wonderful community, uh, I'll start with all the great stuff, which is actually that people have been just so uh, supportive and, and great to work with. But one of the tricky things we inevitably face when we're trying to build these teams is time zones, right? We're currently sitting across many time zones and actually getting people uh, uh, you know, to meet and, and talk can just be logistically difficult. You know, there's not much one can do about it. So, um, you know, connecting with teams in Europe um, at, in one meeting and then at, at another meeting, connecting with a team in, in the US and then trying to somehow make sure that there's cross communication. I mean, that's logistically the tricky thing. Um, in terms of technically tricky things, I think the technically tricky things um, is, bring, so, so in the plate tectonic reconstruction, the physical processes of plate motions, the kinematics are pretty well established. There's uncertainties there, but they're established. It's once you actually start bringing in uh, things that rely on, on biology and chemistry and chemical reactions and the interaction of those things and the feedbacks, that's where it gets really complex. Um, and as Kevin was saying, you know, these really interesting feedbacks, like for example, the, the evolution of uh, open ocean calcifiers 150 million years ago, right, created a, a, a brand new sink of carbon in the oceans, right? These things create skeletons of calcium carbonate in the oceans, and they die and they settle on the sea floor. And so you can see how the biosphere has actually added a whole new component to the deep carbon cycle. Uh, and, and, you know, you, it, it's, it's like tracking those kind of things um, can be difficult. In this case, it, it was a well-studied component, but you know, there's other things that re re rely on the chemistry, say, of ocean water, the pH of, of ocean water, 
sea surface temperatures and so on. I mean, essentially these are challenges that we are going to have to face as a community in the next decade. We've set up the, you know, much of the infrastructure and now it's, uh, it's, you know, we've, we've got to tackle the hard problems. <laughs> but the fun problems, I'm sure. I mean, so there's challenges, but has there been any um, big successes or things that surprised you, um, big results coming out of the collaborations? Uh, well, uh, uh, lots of surprises, but Maddie, maybe you can talk about the, the slabs and the plumes. I think that's yeah. a nice Yeah, that's quite an interesting thing that's come out of the work I've done, which we didn't expect at all. Um, we definitely focus first mostly on sort of, you know, like um, the volcanic um, island arcs and the carbon dioxide that might be outgassed there. But if I just, I'm going to share um, that one for you and do the right thing. Yeah, so as I kind of already talked a bit um, about my work, um, here in the blue curve, again, we can see the slab flux through time. So um, since 100. 230 million years ago. And what's quite interesting, um, quite obvious, I think, is that peak that happens during the mid Cretaceous. We've called it sort of the slab superflux, um, this period where you sort of get this doubling of the amount of volume of slab material um, entering into the mantle over, you know, kind of a 50 million year period. Um, and what we've kind of found interesting is that this, um, the other curves are the large igneous provinces to sort of eruptions of large igneous provinces in the sort of yellow and dark blue. And you see you kind of get this peak, um, you know, the Ontong Java and Hikaringai and Manihiki plateaus around 120 million years ago. So that's kind of occurring in about a 10 million year window after we get this peak of subducted volume. Um, also what we see, this is um, now showing the slab flux, um, but in like um, cumulative of the whole time period. So you can see areas where most of the material was um, being subducted. Um, but we also see uh, super plumes, which are kind of these upwellings, like large scale upwellings of hot mantle material. Um, we know we have evidence that there are sort of two of these that occurred at a similar time, um, similar um, length of time after this um, slab superflux. And that was sort of the Darwin rise and then also um, in South Africa. And we're kind of, um, we're, we're suggesting that perhaps this super, uh, this increase in volume in subductive material actually may have contributed to sort of um, enhanced vigor of convection in the mantle and sort of not necessarily, it might not have, well, triggered, but also kind of encouraged these sort of large igneous promise eruptions and these super swells. And so, as I was saying, this is maybe a, a longer term effect that subduction can have um, on the out, you know, degassing of carbon from the mantle, maybe from the deep mantle, not just say at the subduction zones. Um, so that was, yes, yeah, something that we found quite interesting and will of course need more work to fully understand, but um, yeah, it's something we're looking at. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, do, you have, do you have some uh, uh, surprises up your sleeve? Oh. Yeah, uh, it was kind of interesting to go through all this data that's been published recently and just notice that there have been so many uncertainties in what we know about the deep carbon cycle. And if we take the uncertainties of the present day and extrapolate that back through time, then the uncertainties just blow up massively. Uh, I remember someone at a recent conference uh, pointing at the uh, figure I showed you guys of the total net outgassing. And they pointed out that you could draw a perfect horizontal line through it. You didn't need all those squiggles at all. You could just draw a perfect horizontal line through it, and that would still fit within the uncertainty bracket. So yeah, um, it's surprising that there's still so much that we don't know about the deep carbon cycle. And yeah, it's, it, would, it would be really interesting to see what uh, studies like what we're doing will be able to do uh, to resolve this problem in the future. I'll just say one, one last thing to that. I, I think it's, it's fascinating, right? Because in the past, we've only looked at, say, one component of the deep carbon cycle at a time, say, the large igneous provinces. And, and okay, we can compare that to the, the CO2, atmospheric CO2. But, but like Kevin has said, you know, it's, it's a whole cumulative net effect. And so when you start combining all those effects, you get these un uncertainties, um, uh, 
exploding in a way. And it, it's, you know, it, it's, it's kind of uh, worrying in, in some respects, but, but actually I think it's really important that we start cataloging all of these different components, because I, I think much of the, the benefit will come out in the coming years. And, and really it goes back to what has the community used before. A lot of what's been used before is things like using a global sea level curve and doing some kind of backward calculation, back of the envelope calculation to extract tectonic fluxes of CO2, right? But, but we know for a fact that there are, you know, catalog of like 20 different sea level curves, which are very different. So at least here, we're actually formalizing um, the, the, the approach and making it testable. And as the plate reconstructions improve, we throw more data at it, it'll improve, and, and those uncertainties will hopefully uh, decrease and, and this will become much more meaningful um, in the coming years. So one of the really great things about these platforms that um, you at the Earth Bike Group um, have developed is that they're, a lot of them are open source and available to people. So um, how do you, uh, how does the, a user maybe watching this webinar, how do they get their hands on some of the software and start playing with it? Sure. Well, um, this could be a really good time for a little uh, demo because I, I think it's important. I, one of the things that I um, love about my work um, and the group's philosophy has been to, to share, uh, share everything. Uh, make software workflows, uh, data and models, open access um, and open source. So I'm just going to uh, quit out of my um, talk here um, and I'm just going to open uh, G plates. Okay, so I have I have a G plates windows open here. So G plates is very easy to uh, install. Uh, sorry, I, I yeah, I, maybe I need to uh, minimize this. Okay, that's probably good. Um, and then if I just go to gplates.org, uh, you can just download G plates 2.1 uh, on a Mac, uh, Windows or Linux pre built binaries. If you're very adventurous, you could compile it from source. Why not? Um, and one of the things that happens when you install gplates, uh, if you're on a Mac, going to applications, and there's a folder called sample data. Uh, if you're in a Windows, that's in your program files, gplates, sample data. But we've compiled lots of different data sets just to get you going. And we have a lot more on the website because we can't package everything up um, uh, in, in the installer. And the the way to just get started very quickly is you just open a new window of G plates. It's going to look like an intimidating screen because it's completely blank. Um, let me just, yeah, so here's a blank gray screen. If you go to your sample data, the data bundle for novices, there's a G plates project file. You just grab that, drag it onto your window. And what it does is it grabs some of those other files, you know, shape files, and other uh, rasters and so on that we provide there. You can, of course, bring in your own data. Uh, but, but to get started very quickly, um, now you already have a, um, a reconstruction. You can go back. Uh, this particular model goes back uh, to the Devonian. Uh, you can start uh, playing around with that. Uh, and it's very easy to export the, the geometries that you can start actually, for example, the subduction zone lengths, um, here under the resolve topologies, uh, you can export that as ASCII or shapefile and whatever. Um, and, um, and, and so there's a very flexible uh, interface of how to export and interrogate this, this data. For example, if you're interested in um, just looking at plate velocities, a very interesting uh, aspect of this. So if I go to features, generate velocity domain points, I'll just use our default sitcom S component this is just the mesh resolutions. It's not important that I go into this right now. There's lots of documentation um, about this. I'm just generating um, the mesh points and you'll actually see uh, G plates will then generate these meshes and these are velocities that you can export uh, through time. One of the great things about G plates is um, it's very flexible. So if you're interested in say Australia, our favorite continent, we are based uh, from Australia, uh, its plate ID, this, this uh, identifier is 801, 
And if I go to reconstruction, specify anchored plate ID, say 801 Australia. Uh, G plates interactively uh, fixes Australia and moves the whole world with respect to it. So you can start looking at a relative plate velocities uh, and things like that may be of interest to people. Um, so I, I think that that's probably uh, enough for a little demo, but if I'm happy to, uh, we're happy to, to demonstrate uh, anything else. Maybe Maddie can talk about some of her coral reef growing software as well. Yeah, sure. Um, I'd be happy to talk about that. I've got a few slides that I might just share. Um, ooh, is that the one? No, that's that one. Yeah, so that was the one I was sharing before, but if we go forward. So yeah, as Sabine kind of mentioned, there's um, this um, software called Badlands, which is a landscape evolution model. So um, it kind of models changes in the geomorphology of a landscape through time, kind of um, as a result of changes in climate or tectonics or um, in my case, what I was doing, you can also look at wave climate, so what's going on in the ocean. Um, and yeah, the new thing that um, I was kind of one of the first people to work on was this carbonate growth, um, carbonate platform growth. So you can see in this picture, this was, um, I selected a particular region in the Great Barrier Reef, and the pink, the bright pink things are the carbonate platforms or the reefs that um, I was able to grow in the model. Um, in the lower um, picture, you can kind of see a cross section through one of the reefs. So you can see there how kind of a layer cake of um, how it grew over time. Um, and yeah, this is sort of, um, it's um, the, the carbonate platforms are, are grown based on kind of a simple, it's kind of simple for the minute in that it's based mainly on three environmental parameters. Um, and these um, depth, uh, the sediment tolerance, and so the wave energy tolerance, is what controls the distribution of the carbonate platforms, like where they grow and also their growth rates so or how, how fast they grow. Um, we also can do, uh, one of the assemblages we looked at wasn't just like corals, but um, pelagic carbonates. So, you know, forams and um, those sorts of things that we've talked about. Um, and that's at the moment very simply controlled by depth. So there's a lot of work to be done still on expanding sort of the complexity of this and also expanding it from a regional scale to something that's more global. Um, at the moment, uh, Badlands perhaps doesn't have that capability, but something that Tristan, who developed Badlands, has now developed is kind of a global sort of surface dynamics model called Escape, which could potentially at some point include this carbonate growth um, functionality and could give us an idea of through time, you know, where the favorable conditions were to sort of platforms to grow and therefore you know extending on the work that Jody Powell did in um she can only obviously look at sort of these continental uh, carbonate platforms that are preserved on the continents but we could get an idea of where ones you know current, um, other ones might have been and I just might quickly show you um a quick animation that I have up as well of what one of these model um looks like Oop, that is the wrong one Apologies, bear with me one second. Um, all right, I know that. Uh, can you see, is that, yeah. you can see the right one? Yeah, so this is just an example. You see there, I was looking at changes in sea level and you can see the reefs, those bright pink um, sort of turning on and that growth starting. Um, and then on the right, um, it's just kind of highlighting that erosion and deposition that is basically what's driving the changes in the landscape um, in the model. And you can see the rivers and fluvial system. But uh, yeah, I just want to give you a quick visualization of what the models look like. Um, so yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So we're running short on time here, but I have a couple more questions I want to ask before we sh shut this down. So, um, so then, uh, you know, this is, we're reaching the end of the GCO decade. Um, can you tell us a little bit about where you see G-plates going into the next decade? What's next for this project? Yeah, I, I think um, the community, the geological geoscience community has become very excited about this flexible community platform. Uh, the fact that they can take our plate reconstructions and modify them or use them in any way they want, uh, connected up to their data sets uh, is becoming very interesting. I think the, the next leap will be the data richness, the connection of databases 
uh, bringing far more detail into the paleogeography, bringing in aspects of paleobiology and evolution, um, and exposing a lot of this functionality to data mining, um, machine learning uh, approaches. And I, I think, I think the, the, the future will be to also uh, better formalize uncertainties, capture uncertainties, and reduce uncertainties by having more data um, and, and, and so on. So that, I think that's for the G plates aspect of things. I, I think that's where it's going. And, and perhaps the last thing I would add is combining uh, that digital earth platform uh, with other components, you know, maybe better models of oceanic atmospheric circulation and other aspects, um, you know, like the badlands modeling, the surface process modeling as well. Awesome. Um, so lastly, if there's someone watching this webinar and they want to get in touch with you guys, what's the best way to do that? Uh, yeah, there's, there's lots of different ways. Um, uh, one can uh, email me, um, the Earthbyte website, uh, www.earthbyte.org has all of our contact details. Um, you can find us on Twitter and all kinds of uh, social media platforms, uh, but we're very happy to, uh, to help uh, with any queries. Um, it, especially, uh, you know, a new user being pointed in, in the right direction. I'm very happy with that. There's even a G plates discussion mailing list. Um, so there's lots of resources there and I'm happy to point uh, the community uh, there. Awesome. Well, thank you all very much, Sabine, Kevin, Madison. This was great. And uh, thanks to everyone who uh, joined us on the webinar today. Uh, we'll be posting this webinar as an archive in the next few days. So if you have friends or colleagues you think would be interested, please point them to the DCO website. Um, I just put the uh, link into the chat um, where the archive will be. Um, so, do you know, let people know that the, the archive will be on the website and it will also be on the DCO YouTube channel. So lastly, please join us in two weeks when we'll hear about work from Dmitry Spodensky and Mark Yosko, who have united the melts and dew models for a greater understanding of the movements of deep carbon in Earth. That's at 2 p.m. Eastern on the 20th of March. You can find more information about that and the other webinars in this series um, at the link I just shared. And as always, if you have feedback for us, you can drop us an email at engagement at deepcarbon.net. So thanks for joining DCO Webinar Wednesdays.